We are back. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Weren't those photos amazing? I mean, we have some real talent uh, in our midst among our membership. Um, thank you all for continuing to contribute your photos, your wonderful work to our website um, after each and every field trip. Um, our final and major award of the evening is the Linnaean Eisenman Medal. And tonight it is my very, very great pleasure to name Jenny Duberstein as the 2022 recipient of this prestigious award, the highest award that the, that the society gives. Uh, Jenny, who is with me now, uh, is the director of the Sonoran Joint Venture as a wildlife biologist and conservation social scientist, Jenny has spent her professional career working to build partnerships for bird and habitat conservation across the US and Northwest Mexico. She has directed environmental education programs, developed community-based conservation projects in region, developed and taught courses include on, and workshops uh, on bird identification, e ecotourism, and bird monitoring, and has studied species including the, the double-crested cormorant, other various wading birds in Sonora, and one of my favorites, yellow-billed cuckoos in Arizona. Jenny has also worked with young birders for the past 25 years teaching field ornithology and generally helping connect young people with various opportunities. Jenny received her BS in wildlife biology from Virginia Tech and her MS and PhD from the School of Natural Resources and the Environment at the University of Arizona. Jenny, hello there. Hello. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Is that your backyard in back of you? I see. Uh, that's you a know, lovely. More or less. <laughs> nearby. Okay. <laughs> well, Jenny, uh, here is the Eisenman Medal, uh, which I would now like to present to you. Um, we're going to try something tonight, folks, that's never been done before in the 144 history of the Linnaean Society. I am going to attempt to reach out into the void and pass this through time and space and particles of matter out to Jenny. Jenny, I'm not gonna let go of this until you. I feel you pull it out of my hand. This is just like a relay race, folks. You Cut never it. let the baton go. You let your partner take it out of your hand. So let's not drop that baton, Jenny. You tell me when you have it. Kind of cold and dark but oh there it is. I, I found and it you got it, it. <laughs> she got it look at that folks like magic it's gone and it's in arizona jenny that <laughs> that medal is well deserved i'd also like to mention that today is national women's day i believe and uh, it is just an honor and a pleasure to have you with us um, ladies and gentlemen I introduce to you Jenny Duberstein, the Eisenman Medalist of 2022. Jenny, please take it away. Thank you so much. Okay, give me one second to get my screens coordinated here. All right, I almost just left the presentation. That would be bad. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for your warm welcome, Ken, and that introduction. My name is Jenny Duberstein. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm coming to you this evening from the homelands of the Thano Otam and Pascuayaki, also called Tucson, Arizona, where um, it's, I don't know what time it is, 5.30 here for another day before the rest of the world uh, has daylight savings time, but here in Arizona, we don't. So part of the year I'm on mountain time. And I guess as of next week, I kind of lose track when that happens, I'll be on Pacific time. I'm so happy to join you this evening 
And although I wish that it had been possible for us to gather together in person, um, New York is, is near and dear to my heart. My father grew up in New York. My sister lives on Roosevelt Island. Um, it would have been lovely to, to be able to travel there, to uh, be with you in person. I'm at the same time really grateful for the technology that allows us to, to connect virtually in spite of the, the circumstances in the world. Thank you so much to the Linnaean Society of New York for this tremendous honor. When I got an email from Stephen Chang last April telling me that I'd been selected to be the 2022 Eisenman Medalist, truly you could have knocked me over with a feather. The list of past recipients reads like a who's who of my idols, my role models, my mentors, and to know that my name is going to appear on that same list is honestly too much to believe. I keep expecting someone to tap me on the shoulder and say, yeah, sorry, we meant that other Jenny Duberstein, not you, just kidding. Um, but in all seriousness, I want to express my, my thanks, my gratitude to the awards committee for this recognition, and especially to Rick Wright for putting my name forth for consideration. Thank you. I'm deeply humbled. I'm a little awestruck, and I am extremely glad to be here with you this evening and excited to share more about my work. So um, about two years ago, I feel like everything that every time I mention time, I have to adjust it for COVID, but I think this actually was two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago. Ken Rosenberg, um, who was your 2009 Eisenman Medal recipient um, from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and a bunch of his colleagues published a paper in science that has come to be known as the Three Billion Birds paper um, in short. It documented bird population declines across the United States and Canada, looking at what's been going on with bird populations since the 1970s. And they found that there has been a decline of almost 3 billion birds in those years. That's one out of every four birds that used to exist is gone. This is across almost every bird group. It's true for Eastern forest birds, where there's been a 17% population loss, six out of every 10 wood thrushes are gone. It's true for boreal forest birds where 90% of evening grosbeaks have been lost since 1970. 500 million boreal forest birds lost in those years. It's true for aerial insectivores where there's been a 32% decline. It's true uh, at even higher levels for grassland birds where more than 50% of grassland birds have, have disappeared since the 1970s. Three out of every four Eastern meadow larks has been lost. It's kind of depressing, um, but the paper also had some kind of good news. There's been an increase in raptors, more than 15 million raptors gained in this time, more than 35 million waterfowl have been gained since the 1970s. And the reason for this is when we think about it and take a step back is that for raptors, for instance, we made the decision to ban DDT and other pesticides that were severely impacting their populations. For waterfowl, we created the North American Waterfowl Management Plan and created the North American Wetlands Conservation Act. We invested in conservation. And so the lesson to take away from this is yes, there are huge steep declines, lots of things facing birds and bird habitat um, in our world, but where we invest in conservation, it works. So I started to think a little bit and just put together a list of the, the major things facing bird populations in the area where I work in Southern Arizona, in Southern California and throughout Northwest Mexico and quickly realized that this list, it would be impossible to come up with a comprehensive list. And this doesn't necessarily have things, it, it doesn't only have to do with where I am. A lot of these things, probably are true for birds in New York, true for birds in Florida, true for birds in Saskatchewan, true for birds across the world. The biggest thing facing them is, is changes in their habitat due to development, due to climate change, due to things related to development and climate change like drought, water allocation, stuff like that, development for solar and wind energy. Um, this does not mention things that go along with urban and suburban development, things like outdoor cats, things like collisions with buildings. And if I were there with you in person, this is where I would take a pause and I would say, what do all of these threats have in common? And you might scratch your head for a minute and 
probably you'd have some really great suggestions. Um, but the thing that I want to bring you all back to when you're looking at all of these issues that birds and bird habitat are facing, the thing that they have in common is people. People are the, the driving force behind all of these threats. Ken mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that I'm a conservation social scientist, and that means I work with people to try and um, find solutions to bird and bird habitat conservation. And I'm a really firm believer in the idea that conservation is about behavior. And we usually are not trying to change bird behavior, although occasionally maybe we are. We're pretty much always trying to change human behavior. And we want people to start doing something. Maybe people are doing something great and we want them to keep on doing it. Um, and more often than not, we want people to stop doing something. And so for the rest of my presentation, I'm going to talk to you um, about the work that I do uh, directing the Sonoran Joint Venture. Um, and I'm gonna highlight some of the different ways that, that we are working with people to address the biggest issues facing birds and bird habitat in our region. And then I'm gonna finish up by talking about uh, my favorite thing that I get to do every year, which is working with young birders at bird camp in the summer. So before I dig into the specifics about the Sonoran Joint Venture, I really briefly want to take a step back and tell you what the Migratory Bird Joint Ventures are. This is a map that shows um, our geography. There are joint ventures um, all across the United States, all across Canada, and covering a good chunk of Mexico. And you can go to mbjv.org if you want to learn more than, than you ever need to know about joint ventures. But what I will tell you is that it's a program that started in the mid 1980s with the creation of the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. So they wrote this plan that said, we need to uh, conserve wetlands and waterfowl. And the way that we're going to do it is by creating these partnerships called joint ventures. And joint ventures will bring together state and federal agencies, they'll bring together private industry, private landowners, tribes, nonprofit organizations, academia, to talk about how they can work at a regional scale to conserve waterfowl and wetlands, to figure out what are the biggest priorities, what are the things that we all need to work on together, um, things that where we need to work across borders because they're too big for one organization, one agency, one state, in the case of the Sonoran Joint Venture, one country to take on by themselves. We have to work together to address these big issues. And so the Joint Ventures have been very successful at this for the past 30 plus years. Um, the first, there were six Joint Ventures that were created in 1986. And every few years since then, a few more have, have been created. The Sonoran Joint Venture was created in 1999. Um, and our last Joint Venture, let me put my, pointer on here, uh, just was created right here in this tiny little spot on the central coast of California, the California Central Coast Joint Venture, brand new as of last year. So this is the Sonoran Joint Venture, this big orange area. That's where I work. And I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see it even more. That's our website. We have uh, a mission of bringing together partners to conserve birds and habitats in our geography, so the southwestern United States and northwestern Mexico. And it's a gigantic, gigantic area. It includes all or part of nine states in our two countries. Um, it includes the, the Channel Islands in California, the Baja Pacific Islands, the islands in the Gulf of California. Um, two countries, lots of tribes and sovereign nations uh, within those two countries. Um, and there are 745 species of birds that we have documented using the Sonoran Joint Venture either as breeding habitat, as wintering habitat, or as migratory stopover habitat on their way to and from places heading north and south. Um, and what goes along with all of that diversity is a, a diversity of conservation challenges. And uh, so I say our geography is gigantic, our staff and our budget is teeny tiny. Um, and so we really rely on the work of our partners on the ground and trying to find ways to support them to do um, good work. So what do we do? 
Um, when somebody asks me to describe my job, first of all, I have to explain what a joint venture is. And it's this term they took from the business world that they thought would be a good idea, but mostly it just means I have to explain it. Um, but like I said, we bring together partners. This is a picture of my management board at um, actually our last in-person meeting before, before COVID. Um, and I think of myself as a matchmaker. My role is to know who's doing what, where, and to try and put people in touch with each other, um, to try and connect people with the resources that they need, to try and provide people with the training and capacity building that they need to do their good work on the ground. And so, for example, if somebody comes up to me and says, I would like to start a project studying yellow-billed cuckoos, I might say, oh, are you in touch with this person who's also studying yellow-billed cuckoos? You should work together. Um, or people are interested in starting a project looking at a particular type of habitat and the Sonoran Joint Venture can provide a platform to bring people together to start to have those discussions, to start collaborations, we facilitate discussions, we help coordinate projects, and then we provide support for people doing their work on the ground. And what this looks like um, depends on what the project is. You know, we, I don't get to spend a ton of time doing field work these days, although I do get to do a little bit now and then, um, but we support our partners in doing habitat restoration and protection work. Um, we are big proponents of coordinated bird monitoring. So having people across a broad geography use the same techniques and methods for monitoring birds so that we can all add our, our data together uh, and, and share our knowledge and understanding. Um, I mentioned that I'm a, a social scientist and so we definitely support the use of conservation, social science and human dimensions um, as a means to, to better understand um, our challenges on the ground um, and using strategic communications, education and outreach. How can we develop tools and strategies for talking to people to share the messages that we need to share? Um, I mentioned training. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about ecotourism and then we support research where we have gaps in our knowledge to, to better understand um, the challenges before us. The Sonoran Joint Venture was the first binational joint venture with Mexico. We now have the Rio Grande Joint Venture, which is our, our sister joint venture to the east. Um, but there are some special challenges that come with working across an international boundary like that. Um, communication is sort of the first thing that comes to mind. We speak two different languages. Sonoran Joint Venture staff is all bilingual, um, although not all of our partners are bilingual. And so we can help facilitate communication in that way. Um, technology is less of an issue now than it was, you know, maybe 20 years ago when I first started doing this work when um, south of the border, you know, before everybody had cell phones, before internet was, was quite as widespread and reliable. Um, but that's something that we, we can help to bridge as well. Um, sometimes funding can be a challenge. You know, there's funding that's available, but it can't be spent in Mexico or it can only be spent in Mexico or just getting the funding agreement in place across a border can sometimes have, have special challenges. And so we help to bridge these gaps. Um, bureaucracy, I work for the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, and I'm happy to be an employee of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And at the same time, um, there are certain challenges that come with working for the federal government. Um, and this is true probably in any country in the world. Um, so dealing with, with those bureaucratic issues across two countries and an international border can be challenging. Just getting permission for me to travel to Mexico sometimes feels like it takes almost an act of Congress. And then there are just different cultural differences. And these are all things that, that we um, help to bridge so that people, our partners on both sides of the border can, can better connect and better coordinate. And what I really wanna do, and I'm gonna spend the rest of my presentation doing, is talking to you um, about some of our projects and programs. And the reality is that birds don't recognize geopolitical boundaries. They don't recognize that there's an international border there. And so our efforts to conserve them can't either. And so all of the projects and programs I'm going to highlight are either international in scope or um, are sort of pilot projects that we hope to expand to be international in the near future. I'm gonna start with probably the least exciting in terms of presenting it as a slide, but potentially the most useful for our partners. 
Um, the Sonoran Joint Venture has a, a small grants program, our awards program. And since about the year 2000, when it began, we've given out about a million dollars to our partners to support projects that address um, the highest priority needs in our region. And these are really small grants, $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 is the largest grant that we give out. And particularly in Mexico, these dollars go a long way. This makes a big difference to our partners. And more importantly, our partners leverage the small amount that we're able to contribute with their own funding from other sources, with in-kind contributions, with, with volunteer hours, um, so the impact of these small grants goes even farther. And this is just a screenshot from our website. You can see the, the grants that, that we've given out over the last few years. Um, but for lots of monitoring, habitat restoration, um, community outreach, training, um, capacity building, environmental education, um, lots of different types of projects. We are very involved in providing training and capacity building to our partners. And this is a picture from a workshop that we conducted in Mazatlan. We did a series of workshops for um, biologists at natural protected areas throughout the country, not just within the Sonoran Joint Venture in Mexico, um, to teach them how to design and implement bird monitoring programs within their natural protected area. And so we did a, a workshop for um, protected areas that uh, were coastal or had water birds. And then we did one for areas that were more focused on land birds. And people came for a week. Some people were um, total beginners, didn't know anything about birds. And so we were teaching them how to use field guides, how to use binoculars. Other people were a lot more advanced. And so we had more advanced classes, you know, about statistical design and analysis um, and, you know, in depth, how do you point counts? And um, everybody left with, with, tools to, um, to begin to think about how they can monitor birds in their protected area. Um, I have a few pictures of some of those folks in the field. This is one of our field excursions at the, the land bird workshop. And here's our aquatic bird workshop. It's really rough. You have to go to the beach and teach people how to count birds. Um, but providing resources, providing training for our partners, this is one of the, the ways in which um, we can take our small staff and take our small budget and reach um, kind of a bigger number of people who can then go back to their protected areas or their, um, their organizations or their agencies and share what they've learned um, to reach even more people. I mentioned um, ecotourism. And this is um, a tool that the Sonoran Joint Venture has used to help support conservation efforts. And I think that the word ecotourism, I personally feel like it gets used a lot in situations that, that I don't think necessarily fit the definition of ecotourism. Um, and in my opinion, something in order for it to be considered ecotourism, it needs to contribute to the conservation of the place that's being visited and it needs to contribute to the communities and the people that live in those communities. Um, it's not just going out on a trip and enjoying nature, but it's actually leaving something there and making a positive contribution to um, ensuring that, that those places continue to exist. And so with one of our partners in Mexico, um, a, a nonprofit called Pro Natura Nor Noroeste, we wrote a grant and received funding to um, undertake a two-year bird guide training program. And as part of this, we developed um, the Mexico Birding Trail. And you can actually go, if this website exists right now, you can go to mexicobirdingtrail.org. And the idea was to use ecotourism as a conservation and community engagement tool. And so we worked with our partners in three different locations. So our first spot was right here in the Colorado River Delta. And then we had a spot down in Southern Sonora uh, in a little town called Alamos up in the mountains. And then down in the Southern tip of Baja in San Jose del Cabo. And we had a staff person, a site coordinator at each site that worked with, recruited a team of local community members to be trainees in this guide program. And it was a commitment, it was a two year, program where they got together multiple times a week 
to learn new skills, to learn how to use field guides, how to lead groups. Um, they learned English to be able to communicate with birders coming to visit them who are generally from the United States and Canada. Um, and then they also contributed time to, um, th they had to contribute a certain number of um, volunteer hours. And so they would uh, work on a bird monitoring project of Pronotura in these sites or habitat restoration or an environmental education program in the local school. And the idea with all of this um, was to provide community members with different alternative streams of income. Um, none of these spots, I mean, they're all wonderful. And I think everybody here should go birding in all three of them. Um, but making a living as a bird guide anywhere um, is challenging. And it was never intended that people would be able to quit their day jobs and be bird guides, um, but rather they could occasionally lead trips and take people out to see birds and gain some extra money that way. And by working on those habitat restoration projects, those bird monitoring projects, those environmental education projects, they also gained skills that would allow them to be hired as field technicians um, to work with our nonprofit partners on site. So people were sort of gaining skills and knowledge and experience um, and opportunities for work in a couple of different ways through their participation in this program. So if you go to the website, you can read about the different guides um, in all three different sites. You can see their, their levels of um, skill in a bunch of different areas. And if you want to contact somebody to hire them, you can. there's contact information on the site um, where you can ask them about their availability to lead you on a, on a bird trip um, in any of our three sites. We have, these are some pictures of them in the initial training workshop. So that's how this kicked off with a, a week long sort of intensive workshop. These are some folks you can just see the blue hat of our instructor Eduardo Gomez here. Um, looks like they're talking about some differences in Myarcus flycatchers um, in their Kaufman field guides. And at the end of this workshop, everybody gets, they got a copy of the Kaufman Guía de Campo a las Aves de Norte América, um, the Kaufman Spanish language field guide to the birds of North America, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. I'm um, in a certificate and not everybody in this picture continued for the full two years. Um, and we didn't expect that, um, but we did have a nice strong core of people in each of the three communities that did continue for the three years. And I get, um, I don't know, not every week, but you know, a handful of uh, requests a month through the website of people that are planning tours and want to um, know who to contact and want to learn more about um, uh, the visiting those sites and connecting with, with guides who are trained as part of this program. Okay, I'm going to shift gears and tell you now about uh, one of the more fun projects that I've, I've had the, the pleasure of being involved with. And this is um, a, a project called Desert Avocaching. In Southern California, where uh, part of the Sonoran Joint Venture region, there's a lot of habitat loss from alternative energy development, um, solar energy, wind energy in particular. And this habitat loss is really driving the decline of arid land birds. These bird populations, including Sonoran Colorado Desert, they've declined 46% since 1968. And so what we really needed to know, there's a lot more um, solar and wind energy development being projected for that part of the country. And we wanted to know how are birds using the area? What is the, the potential impact to bird populations? How can we provide that information to agencies like the Bureau of Land Management that manages a lot of that property out there to help them make decisions about mitigation, to help them make decisions about permitting, um, and to help figure out how can we how can we do the best that we can for for these birds how can we balance the needs of, of human populations um, that have growing needs for energy and the idea of, of alternative energy is great but how can we do it in a way that minimizes the negative impact to bird populations Th this is you know a couple of species that we're the most interested in Ben Dyer thrasher on the left it's one of the fastest declining bird species in the region um, over on the right that's a verdon um, and this if I 
opened my window right now and stuck my head outside. I'm at my office on the campus of the University of Arizona. I'd probably hear a verdant chipping away in the, in the mesquite tree outside. And it really feels like they are all over the place in Tucson, which makes it all the more appalling to realize that they have lost more than half of their breeding population over the last 40 years. So it's kind of mind boggling to think about how many verdant there used to be compared to how many verdant there are now. And the way that we tend to approach conservation, certainly in the United States, and I think this is true um, in, a lot of, um, in a lot of our culture, is to wait until things are really bad before we do anything. And wouldn't it be great if we could recognize the need to keep common birds common? Because it's a lot easier to conserve things while they're still common than to wait until they're rare. And so species like the verdant, let's recognize that even though there are still a lot of them, there are a lot fewer than there used to be. And let's, let's think about how to slow those declines, reverse those declines. So our question, we wanted to know how birds were being impacted by solar energy development in Southern California. Straightforward, right? But there's a big red but. We had no money, zero dollars to go out and do the monitoring work that this would require. It's a pretty remote area. It would have required you know, lots of money for gas and vehicles and a team of biologists to send them out there and do all this survey work. Oh no, Wh whatever shall we do? Well, we decided to um, take a page out of the social psychologist's book and think about how could we appeal to birders? What is it that drives birders to bird? And can we use that knowledge to develop a game that will entice them to bird in the locations where we need information? So they'll still be having fun out birding, but they'll just be doing it in the spots where we have information gaps. And from that idea was born the game Desert Avocaching. And it uses eBird to entice birders to go to the spots where we need information. Um, it's avocaching is, it's the idea of geocaching plus eBird, where instead of going to a geocache and finding some little treasure in a box that somebody left behind, the birds are the treasures and you submit eBird checklists. Um, the idea for avocaching was created by folks at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and they piloted it in a few areas um, in and around Ithaca. And I heard about it and I said, that sounds amazing. Let's do it in, in the desert Southwest. And so we, we in collaboration with the Cornell Lab, um, with support from Point Blue Conservation um, and other partners, we created this game. And what we really tried to do was highlight the adventure aspect. Um, birding in areas that were kind of unknown, gathering information about things that no one has seen before. And in case that wasn't exciting enough, we also had glorious prizes for people, um, you know, t-shirts or hats or apps for your phone or um, digiscoping adapters and optics, things like that that were donated by some of our wonderful partners. And we created a website um, where you can get onto our, this section of our website and, and read about desert avocaching. So how does it work? Well, we worked really closely with the eBird hotspot reviewers in California and Nevada, because this, is, this was the geography for where this solar energy development is happening. And we created a series of every little colored balloon here is one of our avocaches. And some of these were existing eBird hotspots. So they were spots that, um, that where there had only been none or one or two checklists submitted, but very little activity. And then some of them were new hotspots that we created just for this game because they were in areas where we needed information, um, but nobody was birding there. And then there was a third category. We worked in partnership with the Desert Thrasher Working Group that's looking at the decline of birds like Ben Dyer's Thrasher across the desert Southwest and, and Sonora um, and added some spots where they needed to know were there thrashers there. So if you went to this website, this is not live so you can't see it. Let me make my pointer bigger. There we go. You could click on any one of these little bullets and a window would pop up and it would have a link 
to the eBird page where you could see if any lists had been submitted. So you might click on it and say, oh, no eBird checklists have ever been submitted for this point. I'm going to be the first person to submit one. You can drive there and submit your checklist. Um, and it was also connected to Google. This map was created in Google. So if you're on your phone, you could click on a point and just hit navigate and it would tell you exactly how to get there. So the, we developed a strategic communications plan. We thought a lot about who are our target audiences? Who are we trying to reach? What burgers in what area? What are the messages that we wanna to get to them? Um, how are we gonna deliver that message to them? Um, and the way that we delivered the message mostly was by going to Audubon groups, going to birding clubs and giving presentations about the game and inviting people to come and join us. Um, we created a social media toolkit. That's what you're looking at right now. This is one of the graphics from that toolkit that we shared with partners so that they could promote the game. Um, we published an article on the eBird homepage that went out um, with their January newsletter that year. This was a couple of years ago that we did this. So every person who was subscribed or who's a, who uses eBird got notification about it. And we basically just shared uh, information about this opportunity with every birding audience in the region that we could come up with. There was a live leaderboard that showed the standings of participants. And so the way this works was for every checklist that you submitted from one of our abacaches, you got one point. Um, and at the end of each month, the game ran from February to June. So at the end of each month, for everybody, for every checklist that you submitted, your name got entered into a, a virtual hat and we pulled a winner out and the winner got a prize. And then there was an overall winner at the end of the game for the person that had submitted the most checklists. But what we were trying to do with this live leaderboard was to appeal to Berger's sense of competition. So eBird, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, has their top 100 lists. So you can see, you know, are you the top birder in the world or in the country or in your state? or in your county, um, the top birder, either in terms of the number of checklists you've submitted or the number of species that you've seen. And so we were trying to um, make this game um, to use those, those motivations that eBird uses since eBird's the tool that we were using. And so you can see the names of the observers here, the number of species each person had observed and the number of points. So Carrie Ross, um, who was actually our overall winner um, at this point in the game had submitted 148 different checklists to our game. So we had a lot of people um, submit just a few checklists and then a few people submit a lot of checklists. So what are our results? Well, we had over 70 burgers submit over 400 checklists with observations of over 140 species. We estimate that avocashers contributed over 500 hours of their time and probably about $3,000 in mileage to travel to and from those desert avocaching locations. This is one of the challenges. These spots are kind of in the middle of nowhere. And then we were able to take those data, take those observations and do some analysis. And our biologists are still actually in the deep in the analysis mode for this data. But this is the map that shows the number of uh, presumed migrant individual birds per minute of observation. And so the areas with the the bigger circles are spots where more neotropical migrants are moving through. And you can imagine if I were to overlay a map, say of um, planned solar energy development, you know, maybe we want to think about avoiding some of these spots where there are big circles and lots of migrants moving through. Maybe um, if we're going to develop there, we need to think about what are the species um, that are moving through, where can we invest in habitat, restoration, conservation efforts to offset those impacts to birds. So we learned um, through the use of social science that birders are suggestible. We knew already that citizen science and resources like eBird are really important for collecting data for bird conservation. And there's some just unbelievable tools that, that the folks at the Cornell Lab have been able to build thanks to all of the observations to eBird that people have contributed. But social science helped us, social psychology helped us realize that with the right incentives, we can actually influence birder behavior. We can get them to bird in different places where they had not previously been birding, which is pretty neat. Of course, we learned 
through that, that map that I just showed that migratory birds are potentially going to be impacted by habitat loss or habitat alteration caused by solar energy development. So we're sharing this, this information with our partners at the BLM and other folks who can use it in their, in their discussions of mitigation efforts. And I mentioned the Desert Thrasher Working Group has helped them test and improve their models to predict desert thrasher habitat. Um, they, some of our um, avocashers spotted thrashers in areas where they didn't think thrashers would be. There were other spots where they fully thought there would be thrashers, but no thrashers were seen. Um, so it helped them um, sort of figure out where they want to do work in the future to make their work a little bit more efficient and decrease costs. And I do just want to give a shout out to Kerry Ross, our, our winning avocasher, he who submitted 148 checklists over the course of the game. I'm now going to shift gears a little bit more um, and talk to you about some of the conservation tools that we've developed in the Sonoran Joint Venture to help, again, things to help our partners um, improve their work on the ground and uh, improve their ability to work together. And everything that I'm going to share with you now is part of the Borderlands Avian Data Center, which you can um, access at borderlandsbirds.org. This is a node of the Avian Knowledge Network. I could talk for 45 minutes just about the AKN, so I'm going to try and do this in two to three minutes. Um, but I mentioned before the birds, the habitats, they don't care about the geopolitical boundaries. Um, but unfortunately, those geopolitical boundaries often create barriers for communication and collaboration. We see things like a lack of coordination for protocols, a lack of coordination for data management, um, and just an inability to easily collaborate across projects, particularly when they're um, in two different countries or two different states. And so the Borderlands Avian Data Center, or BADC as we call it, is an online collaboration platform where biologists can come to share, to analyze, and to visualize their data across monitoring projects. And it's the first international bilingual node of the Avian Knowledge Network. So, oh, there's the website. This is the geography that it covers. It's much bigger than the Sonoran Joint Venture. Um, it goes a lot farther east, but we kind of looked at where our partners were and where the interest was and decided to, to make it um, cover the entire international boundary between the United States and Mexico. This is the work of a lot of different partners. The Sonoran Joint Venture hosts BADC um, and oversees it sort of day-to-day -day operations, but there are a lot of people involved and organizations involved in its creation. Um, I particularly want to thank the Bureau of Land Management who funded the creation of, of the platform. Um, it's bilingual. You can change languages between English and Spanish. There's a little Mexican flag at the top and a, a US flag, and you can just toggle back and forth. Um, and we, we rely on uh, a whole network of regional coordinators to support bird monitoring partnerships and projects throughout our region. There are some tools that you, you don't have to be, um, have a username and a password. You could all get on to borderlandsbirds.org right now and check out our observations map. These are all publicly available data. Um, you can get in there and you can search for by a particular address. You can say, I'm really interested in yellow-billed cuckoos um, and choose a da date range. You can choose different data sources. These are you know, all of the area surveyed data that are in the Avian Knowledge Network, point count data. You can look at breeding bird surveys. You can pull in eBird data. Um, and then there's a variety of different overlays that you can put. So you can see um, you know, what birds are in the congressional district 51 in Southern California, for example. This overlay that I have shows the boundaries of the joint venture. So it's showing me point count and area survey data within the Sonoran joint venture. And if I clicked on any one of these points, a whole list would pop up over here that shows me which birds have been seen in that area based on those publicly available data. So it's just a really uh, straightforward and easy way to get a quick glimpse of which birds are in a particular area. We have a phenology tool, um, which is kind of cool. There's a big map. You click on select area. You draw a little polygon. And here I've drawn a polygon around the, the Colorado River Delta. 
And then you, if you're interested again in just a particular species, you can type that species in. Um, or if you want to see all the species, you just click create graph and it returns a whole list. This one I looked just for long bill curlew showing presence and abundance of that species or of whatever species have been observed in that polygon. So if you are interested in knowing when is the best time to see long bill curlew in the Colorado River Delta, you know, you might want to go in January because that's when they are um, most abundant. Probably going in May is not such a great time. We have tools that help our partners um, consider the, the impacts of climate change on potential bird distribution and habitat suitability. Um, and so the idea behind this tool, which is called PLUMA, stands for Planning for Landscape Management and Adaptation, is that when we consider climate change, we need to think about things that are important right now today, where we have to conserve them or it's going to disappear. We have to think about what's going to happen in the future. Where should we be investing money in habitat conservation and restoration? Um, given that we think sea level is going to rise however many inches over the next 50 years or however many feet um, over the next X number of years, do we want to invest $50 million in conserving this coastal marsh if it's predicted to be underwater in 25 years? Um, and then we need to think about what are the places that we need to conserve because they're going to help us transition from where we are today to where we think things are going to be in 50 years. And that's the whole idea behind Pluma, behind this, this tool. So you can choose one of uh, a number of habitat types. We have about 70 species of birds that we've modeled. So you can choose the bird species. We have five different future climate scenarios, five different models. And then you can choose the time period. And what it gives you is a habitat suitability map, um, given um, whatever choices you've, you've made here. Over on the right-hand side, this is the current or the historical breeding range, um, in this case of Lucy's warbler. And this is showing how that is predicted to change if there's a 2.4 um, degree Celsius increase in climate. The darker blue colors, those are the areas where the habitat is predicted to be the most suitable. Um, so you can see that's a fairly substantial change for Lucy's warbler. Um, this model is predicting that they're going to really expand um, to the east, given this climate model. And so if you're interested in Lucy's warbler conservation, um, it might not occur to you that these are the areas we should be working to conserve. They're not important to Lucy's warbler today. Like they're historically, they're not breeding there, but uh, in 25, 30 years, maybe they will be. And so this is the tool that helps uh, people make those decisions um, about where should we be doing our work. Um, on the back end, you can create a username, you can create an account um, and use the Borderlands at Avian Data Center to manage your bird monitoring data. So if you're a project leader, you can create projects, um, have your survey locations and protocols and create roles for your researchers. If you're a biologist and that is working as part of one of those projects, you can log in and enter all your data. Um, if you're an analyst um, and you want to study those data, you can, you can get in there and analyze, you can visualize your data. You can um, communicate with other people that are working on the project. So maybe there's somebody in Arizona working on thrashers and there's somebody on Sonora working on thrashers and there's somebody in California working on thrashers and they're all project leaders on the same project. So they can all log in and see each other's data in the same platform um, and support each other that way rather than having three separate projects where nobody's in communication with each other. That's really the big picture goal. And so the way that we are using the Borderlands Avian Data Center is to support these working groups. And so we have the Desert Thrasher Working Group, which I mentioned, you can go, some of these slides are in Spanish and some are in English, just to demonstrate that, that bilingual nature of the website. Um, you can learn about this, uh, this working group, you can read about their mission, you can uh, read their goals and objectives, see who the members are, you can download protocols, you can download data sheets, you can access videos, training videos, um, and then you can log in and enter your own data if you're part of this team. We're supporting a team 
um, in Northwest Mexico that is using Bad Sea to manage their data for um, secretive marsh birds. And we are supporting a team um, of folks from the US and Mexico that are working on um, coordinating uh, for brown pelican monitoring across borders. Okay, I'm jumping from one, one cool project to the next. I'm trying to give you a, a snapshot of all the different things we do. I want to, I think this is the last one, and then I want to tell you just briefly about some of the work I do with young birders. Um, we, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the ecotourism project, the Kaufman uh, field guide to the birds of North America. Um, and back in, I don't, I need to double check the year, a long time ago, probably close to 20 years ago, um, I was at this hummingbird festival in Tucson and I met Ken Kaufman for the first time, your 2013 Eisenman Medal recipient. And he uh, came up to me, he knew I worked in uh, Northern Mexico and he said, you know, I wrote this field guide. I'd really like to get it translated into Spanish. Do you have any suggestions for people who could do that? And so I put him in contact with, with a couple of people and um, he reached out to them and Patricia Manzano Fisher um, was one of them. She ended up translating the field guide for him, which was wonderful. He paid um, out of his own pocket to translate this field guide into Spanish because he recognized the need for a resource like this, that there was no comprehensive Spanish language field guide to the birds of, of um, the United States and Canada and Northern Mexico, I guess, North America. And so once it was created, the next thing was, okay, how do we get this field guide into the hands of people who need it? And yes, you can sell it in bookstores, but a lot of the people who need it don't have access to bookstores um, or maybe don't even have the capacity to purchase them. And so the Sonoran Joint Venture together with Black Swamp Bird Observatory, Ken's wife, Kimberly Kaufman, is the executive director of Black Swamp Bird Observatory. We created this program called Donate the Guia. And the, it's grown since then. Pronatura Vera Cruz is part of it, as is Birds Caribbean. And how it works is you, um, or me, or anyone, can buy a copy of the Guia um, at cost. I think it's about $12 from Black Swamp Bird Observatory. Black Swamp Bird Observatory sends those guides to the Sonoran Joint Venture or Birds Caribbean or Pronatura. And our partners can request copies of the guide for work for use in their programs. And we donate them to people who have a need, who need to use field guides for education, who need to use field guides for monitoring, um, who are biologists that just you know, need to have a field guide. Um, and so over the course of the last I don't know, 20 years, we've donated a lot of field guides. We've given them to indigenous communities doing bird monitoring work. And this is a picture of four uh, Konkak women, which it's an indigenous tribe in the central coast of Sonora that are part of a bird monitoring team. We've given field guides to people doing environmental education programs. We've used Kaufman guias in training programs like our bird guide uh, program that I mentioned earlier. We've used guias in our bird monitoring workshops. And we have distributed thousands and thousands of these that have been donated uh, by people just like you um, and distributed to folks, mostly partners and projects in Mexico um, for the Sonoran Joint Venture. I've also sent guias to several countries in South America and Central America. I've sent guias to multiple programs in the United States that speak with Spanish speaking audiences. Um, and, you know, speaking frankly, this field guide really has been a game changer. Um, it, before, when I would do a workshop, I'd have kind of a hodgepodge of, I'd have a Sibley guide and a, a Kaufman guide in English and a Nat Geo guide and maybe an old Golden guide. And um, they were all in English. And I would try to use those to teach people who didn't speak English how to use a field guide to identify birds. Um, and you can imagine the challenges with that. Um, so having, having a field guide in the language that people speak um, has just been such a tremendous, um, such a tremendous gift and really important to us in being able to accomplish the work that we do. Um, okay, so with that, I'm gonna just say, if you want to learn more about the Sonoran Joint Venture, um, I invite you to go to sonoranjv.org. If you really wanna get involved, we have a science working group that is open to anybody with an interest in birds and bird habitat conservation in our region. Um, we have a, a bi-monthly newsletter 
um, and then a listserv also. So if you would like to, to learn more, I invite you to, to come to our website and learn more about that. But what I wanna spend just the last few minutes of our time together doing is talking to you about my longest term relationship. And that is with BirdCamp. Um, so in 1997, I got hired by um, Susan Bonfield, who actually is the, she's the executive director now of Environment for the Americas, which is the, the organization that is in charge of World Migratory Bird Day. She was uh, then the education director at what was then called Colorado Bird Observatory. It's now called Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And she hired me to run their young birder program. And they had a, a youth field ornithology camp where kids would come for um, 12 days to up to two weeks to learn um, about how to conduct research. And so they would come and learn about birds. They would come up with a research question. They would learn how to collect data. They would analyze their data. They would actually write a short paper and give a presentation at the end of that camp. Um, and so that was, that was when I had been working in environmental education before that, but not um, bird focused, not with young birders. And starting in 1997, um, that's where it all began. There's baby Jenny right there in the middle. I look kind of like one of the campers. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that when I got hired to, um, to do this program, I was too young to rent um, a rental vehicle. So when I hired my staff, one of the prerequisites was you have to be 25 years or older so that somebody can drive the rental van. Um, and every summer since then, just about with the exception of you know, pandemic years, I have spent part of my summer in the field um, with young birders. And these are some pictures. They look a little bit blurry because they're actually scanned from, from prints back in the days before digital photography. This is me. Um, here's a quick story. This, this young man, his family moved to Tucson. And a couple of years ago, um, the, the, my landlords had sent somebody to dig up the gas line in my backyard. And there's like this big burly guy in a jumpsuit in my backyard with a pickaxe digging up the dirt. And he says, Jenny? <laughs> and I didn't recognize him at all. He's like, it's Matt, Matt Norris. And he showed up randomly in my backyard working for the gas company, which is sort of fun. Um, but truly spending time in the field, I was trying to do the math to figure out how many young people have come through the programs that, that I've been part of over the last 25 years this summer. Um, will be my 25th summer at bird camp. Um, I don't, it's at least 750 kids, maybe closer to a thousand. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I've lost count. This is a picture from last summer when we were so excited to, at the very last minute, be able to make the decision that in spite of the pandemic, um, we had found a safe way, a way that we felt safe about to hold camp. And so here we are up in the Alpine Tundra in Rocky Mountain National Park at Medicine Bow Curve. And bird camp is just important, you know, youth as a young birder. I feel like today with um, the sort of the ease with which people can communicate with each other, young birders don't feel quite as alone because they have ways to find each other, but it's, you know, it's, there aren't a lot of kids out there that are that interested in birds. And I think a lot of them just really feel kind of isolated and like they have to hide their interests and who they really are. And these camps um, are an opportunity for them to come together, to be their true selves, to um, just geek out over nature and know that the people that you are there with are gonna be just as excited as you are about everything that you're seeing. We spend time with researchers learning about um, bird banding and conducting point counts and different studies and getting ideas about careers in ornithology and conservation, and also just getting ideas for ways that that you can make birds a part of your life, even if your career ends up being something completely unrelated to birds. Um, th there, there are lots of ways that we can incorporate birds and birding into our lives. We teach kids what we call field craft. So this is uh, a field journaling workshop that I was leading. We teach field sketching, we teach photography. We do workshops on things like iNaturalist and Seek. Um, and using apps to, to help us identify what we're doing. We do workshops on, on writing. Um, we've done workshops on social media and sort of ethical uses of social media. Um, just all kinds of 
ways to um, help kids connect with each other and connect with birds and connect with nature. A few more pictures. It's it really at the end of the day, it's it's a way for kids to spend time with other young people that are interested in the same things that they're interested in. This is me up at the front. Here we are at somewhere above uh, 12,000 feet above sea level, um, up above the Alpine Visitor Center in Rocky Mountain National Park. And this is a picture. Um, this was from our camp last year, um, where just, you know, we made the decision to have camp probably about a month before we held it. We were sure we were going to have to cancel it. And then all of a sudden, as things do in this pandemic, things just changed. And we had this little window of opportunity. And we were able to get this small group together. Um, and it was kind of the first sense of, I don't know if we'll ever have normal again, um, but it felt kind of normal to these kids. Um, and bird camp is just a chance for kids to feel like they belong, where they don't have to hide who they are. I've never seen um, in the 25 years that I've been doing this, I've just every year, I'm just sort of amazed and awestruck at how kind and accepting kids are of everybody. We're all, every single human being, we're all just kind of weirdos, you know? We all have our strange quirks and the things that, that we like that nobody else likes. Um, and bird camp just seems to be a way to celebrate all of those things that make us unique and make us different. Um, it's also sort of a neat opportunity for kids to learn from, um, you know, folks that are doing really cool and important things in the field. And so I want to highlight some of the instructors um, that kids get to interact with. And then the very last thing I want to do is just show you some sort of where do kids go? So they come to bird camp, where do they end up? What are they doing now? So this is Jordan Rudder. Um, she's the director of public relations at the American Bird Conservancy. And she's uh, one of the instructors for the camp that I run for the American Birding Association, Camp Colorado. Um, she was one of the young birders of the year for the American Birding Association back in her youth. She's still a kid as far as I'm concerned. Um, this is Rafael Galvez, who is an artist. He's a field guide author. He's an educator. He leads tours for VENT, for Victor Emanuel Nature Tours. That's Corey Borgman. She's a land bird biologist with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and so this was uh, part of my instructor team, who you can't see is Bill Schmoker, um, who was taking the picture. Um, but, and there's Raymond Van Buskirk, who uh, is a tour leader for Wings, another one of the big bird tour companies and one of the owners of Brant, the birding, nature, birding and nature tours company. And then back there in the corner, he's my intern for several years running. This is Joel Such. He is a graduate of our bird camp program. So a past bird camper. He also was an ABA Young Birder of the Year and he's currently a graduate student at Prescott College. Um, and that's me. This is um, a picture from July 2000. Um, this was the first young birder conference that the American Birding Association did, which I, I co-led with um, my colleague, Lena Di Gregorio. Um, so we jointly worked, the American Birding Association and Colorado Bird Observatory worked together to put this together. And these, so these kids, these kids, these, these people are all like 40 or older now. Um, it has, there's people like um, Scott Yanko, who has his own environmental consultancy today. We have people like Nick Barber, who's an associate professor of community ecology and restoration at San Diego State University. Uh, that's Nick Block, who is an assistant professor teaching biology at Stonehill College outside of Boston. Um, you can barely see David Vanderplein there, but you know it's him because of his red hair. Um, he worked for a long time as a field biologist for a variety of different conservation organizations, um, and he's currently a PhD student studying ornithology at Louisiana State University. Um, that's Michael Redder there. Um, he's the editor, one of the editors of Birding Magazine. He's working on a field guide to the birds of Mexico, and he has also been one of uh, our instructors at Camp Colorado. This little guy here um, is definitely taller than me now, that's Gabe Lighty. Um, and he uh, doesn't work professionally in bird conservation, but birds are still a huge part of his life. He's also um, a, a very passionate nature photographer and still definitely connected with birds. 
Right here, we have Ben Winger, who is an assistant professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Michigan, where he's also the assistant curator um, for the bird collection at the Museum of Zoology. We have Jen Brumfield, who is uh, a Cleveland Metro Parks naturalist and a Camp Colorado instructor. Um, also, probably a year or two before this, she was one of the Young Birders of the Year, the very first ABA Young Birder of the Year. We have people like Jesse Berry, who is the Merlin, Merlin program manager at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So if you use the Merlin app on your phone, which is just amazing, if you don't have it, I highly recommend it, it's free. Um, Jesse oversees that program. And so I, I ran out of room on this slide, but I could keep putting little arrows and, and pointing out um, where a lot of these kids have gone on. Not all of them have gone on, a lot of them actually in this picture have gone on to do things directly related to birds and to conservation. Um, plenty of them haven't, but they're still engaged and they still enjoy birds and they still enjoy birding, which at the end of the day is hugely important. And then I just, I do wanna show you, this is Johanna Beam. This is a picture of our group from last year. She was a past bird camper. She was my intern for our program in Colorado last year. She was also um, a young birder of the year in her youth. And she's currently a PhD student studying avian genetics at Penn State University. This is Scott Olmsted, who is a high school Spanish teacher by day um, and was able to, because he doesn't work in the summers, was able to come spend a week as a bird camp instructor for me last summer. He's an eBird reviewer. He has also been a tour leader for tropical birding in the past. So he's got lots of different interesting experiences to share with the kids. That is Jen Brumfield, our past bird camper, the Cleveland Metro Parks naturalist. Remember that face? So in 2000, she was a participant in the camp. Uh, and in 2020, it's 22 now, 2021, um, she was an instructor and she's been an instructor for, for a number of years. And so that's kind of one of my favorite things, there's me, um, is seeing kids come back, um, seeing sort of that life cycle, staying in touch with them, hearing what they're up to, writing letters of recommendation for them to get into college or to get into get scholarships or get into training programs um, and helping continue to connect them with opportunities and with each other. And in many cases, hopefully getting to work with them again um, as peers when they get older. And then I'm just gonna end with this picture. This is a picture from Camp Shirakawa a couple of years ago at the famed uh, Patagonia picnic table. Um, and if you've, if you've heard of the Patagonia picnic table effect, you will uh, know the significance of this. And if you don't know what that is, I encourage you to Google it. Um, this is always a highlight of Camp Chiricahua, which is a, a program of Victor Emanuel Nature Tours that I help uh, lead every summer here in Southeast Arizona. And so I'm gonna stop talking now. Um, thank you for giving me this time to share a bit about my work. And um, I think, I hopefully I haven't talked too much and we have some time for questions and discussion. Okay, Jenny, thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. I love how you balanced the avian and human needs, uh, you know, so that it's a, sort of, we all live together in one world. And I also have to say, I don't think you made any friends with New Yorkers for saying they're a burden that you can hear during the talk. People <laughs> don't like to hear that kind of thing. Uh, we become very, very jealous very quickly. Um, I also want to say, I think that you really embodied the encouragement of the amateur aspect of the award and it was really great to see all of those young birders many I think the people in the pictures probably are at least amateur birders now but so many who go on to successful careers working with birds um, we have a bunch of questions I just want to say first there are a bunch of people who had their hands up in the Q&A if you can please type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen that would be great and I will do my best to answer it um, also, if you're having trouble doing that and you have my phone number, there are people also texting me with questions. So we'll be using many different formats to get questions to Jenny. Uh, hopefully we can get a lot to you in a few minutes, but I'm going to start off by asking you um, a great question came. Uh, someone asked, I love the use of social psychology to navigate around barriers to research. Are there other ways in which you're looking to tap into social psychology for conservation purposes? Yeah, I think generally we don't have a, I don't have a specific project that I can tell you, but generally speaking, I think the importance of understanding 
people's values and beliefs is, is often overlooked. And so when we're looking at, at undertaking conservation work somewhere or working with the community, um, taking the time to do that work and talk to people and get to know what's important to them, what do you believe, why do you believe that, what's important to, to what, what drives your behavior um, will help us be successful in figuring out what's the best way to approach it. Um, I think so often we go in with just like the, the blinders of we have to conserve this habitat at all costs. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of the model of how we do that in the United States is we're going to create parks and we're going to get all the people out of the parks or we're going to create protected areas where people don't live inside of them. Um, and I think that um, taking the time to, to understand what what people want and what their values are and why they believe what they do and why they are, are undertaking the behavior that they undertake is, is really important. And someone texted me a related question that I think is a good, um, that pairs well with the first question and that related to the ecotourism guides and how do they view that work? Do they view that as just a, a means, a, a way to earn money or do they think of that as contributing to a greater good? Um, that, that would be an interesting question to ask them. <laughs> I think that um, they, I don't know, it probably differs from guide to guide. I, some of them are people that go out and, and love nature and enjoy birding on their own. Um, some of them are people that it really is, you know, it's a, it's a economic diversification mechanism. Um, some of it recognize that the conservation work that the that the NGOs are doing and then they're involved with in their community, not only are conserving birds, but they're contributing clean water and clean air and things that, that benefit people as well as birds. Um, I would say there's there's a whole spectrum of, of people's perspectives there. Okay, switching gears a little bit, given that it is International Women's Day, someone asked, have you personally faced adversity in the field as a woman? Oh gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the, that's the short answer. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I have, you know, I, um, I actually wrote a blog post about um, when, when the Me Too movement was, was gaining lots of momentum. I, I sort of was thinking a lot about how it's impacted me. And I was remembering one of my very first, I think it was my very first field job. Um, I worked at this Osprey reintroduction program in Southwestern Pennsylvania. I grew up um, outside of Pittsburgh. And the, the man who was in charge of it um, was just, you know, not a good person. And if I ran into him today, I would have dealt with it much differently. But he, um, you know, he sexually harassed me, basically. I was 19 years old, maybe 20 at most. I think I was probably 19 and had no idea how to handle it. You know, it was, it was fortunately, you know, mostly just obnoxious and uncomfortable, but nothing awful. But I look back and I'm just like, yeah, I shouldn't have had to deal with that. And then, you know, there's just stuff that I deal with all the time. I'll be in a meeting and I'll say something and nothing happens. And then the man sitting next to me will say exactly what I just said. And everybody's like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> Good suggestion, Joe. No offense, Joe. Um, yeah, so I, I don't feel like I face adversity as a woman in conservation any more than I face adversity as a woman in the world. Um, but yeah, for sure. I mean, it's sort of comforting and also awful to hear at the same time. It's, you know, we all, you know, feel better knowing we're not alone in this. So thank you so much for sharing um, what it's like for you as a professional and just as a person in the world and, and sort of what you, you face. And I'm gonna switch gears again, um, just so we can get through the questions. And so someone asked, is there avocaching, avocaching, cash avocaching in Mexico also? Not yet. Not yet. We're, we're working on a proposal right now. We really, we need more funding to continue it. Cornell Lab actually donated their time uh, for that first trial project. Um, but we're working on a, on a proposal with some partners in Southern California, and we'd love to expand it to Sonora to look at urban riparian restoration projects. So one of the challenges with, with the program that we did is that those sites were like way out in the middle of nowhere and required people to drive far distances to get to them. And so we're, we want to look at um, how can we encourage birders to bird in areas that are close to cities in spots where, you know, there, there's often investment in habitat restoration. There is far less often investment in ongoing monitoring to look at the results and the impact of that restoration. And so we thought that, that birders could be a great way to, 
to contribute that data. And we'd love to, there's great riparian restoration work happening in Northwest Mexico also, and we'd love to expand it to there. Yeah, I mean, when I was listening, I thought a lot to myself about how can you replicate this sort of study and make it almost like a, a sort of kit that people could use, you know, uh, you know, in the US or worldwide to get you know, uh, get people who are, you know, hobbyist birders or even, you know, more competitive birders to engage in the sort of citizen science or community science, I think as people call it more now, to really, I mean, it seems like there's really robust data that's being collected in these studies. And so, you know, um, certainly it takes a certain amount of effort to design a study so that you can, you know, uh, make sure that the data that you're collecting is, is, you know, relevant or fruitful. And so do you see a future where people are um, using this model um, in, in other places sort of widely? I hope so. I mean, the challenge that, that we faced was um, that I, I don't know how much it would have cost if the Cornell lab had charged us for their time, their staff time to, to do the, like the back end programming that created that, um, that leaderboard. And when they did it in Ithaca, they actually changed, you would get different numbers of points depending on where you went. So if there were spots where nobody was going the next week, those spots would be worth more points. And so they actually used game theory um, to, to decide um, who got points for going where. Um, but I think, I don't know, like at the end of the day, it feels like that's the kind of thing that, that a computer could be programmed to do, and then it could be applied wherever you want it to apply it. Yeah. I think and that'd those, be amazing. Oh yeah. No, it, it's also super fun. You know, it just, it, it's, uh, makes you, it, it makes you want to get out of bed a little bit more in the morning, I guess, when there's just this little prize involved. So someone else asked, um, tell us about the software you, you mentioned for bird monitoring. Is it something like eBird? Is it more sophisticated? Does it have a bilingual like option? Oh, so the the Borderlands Avian Data Center. The so yeah. it's not it's not like eBird. It's not that is not intended for the bird watcher to go and submit your checklist. It's an online platform for uh, managing bird like in depth bird monitoring data. So point counts, um, area searches, that that sort of thing. So it's it's really targeted at biologists who are doing um, kind of regional bird monitoring. Okay, I think this might be one of the last questions, but this is something I've, I'm like personally very interested in too. And that's um, when you're talking about some of the getting, convincing some of the government uh, constituencies and, and landowners to make decisions regarding the Lucius warbler as an example, I, I was curious like what, how hard it is to convince people to make a conservation based decision about a projected time in the future. And I think you use like 25 to 30 years about where um, the species is likely to occur later and, and whether that's really, if people can only respond to, you know, uh, an immediate concern or whether people have the, whether, whether you found that people can, uh, you know, make a decision based on something that seems you know, beyond their lifetime in some cases. Yeah, I think it's hard. It's really, I mean, especially with climate change where it feels like, you know, the farther out in the future you go, the more uncertain those models become. Um, and, you know, we can barely predict what the weather's gonna do <laughs> tomorrow, much less what the climate's gonna do 50 years from now. Um, but, you know, it's it's a tool to support decisions. It's, it's the, when I'm talking to people, and I have a conservation goal in mind, this is also where social science comes in. I need to understand if somebody's not interested in Lucy's warblers, I'm not gonna try and convince them that Lucy's warblers are really important and they need to care about them. I might like, we work with people um, around the Salton Sea. And when we talk to members of Congress from that district, we aren't talking about the importance of conserving the Salton Sea for birds. We're talking about, we're gonna do this restoration work and it's going to decrease um, the dust particulates in the air, and it's going to help deal with, with asthma in children. It's going to help reduce asthma rates in children because the air is going to be cleaner. Um, and so that's where like understanding people's priorities, understanding their values is so important. And so it takes, I think the sort of the people working on the conservation side of things to have that big picture view, like this is according to the information that I have now, I think that this spot is what we need to conserve. And then to figure out what are the messages that you need to use to convince the people in power to conserve that land and then adapt, you know, you make changes 
much like we are learning daily during the COVID pandemic, you know, new information comes to light and maybe you change your guidelines and change what you're doing um, based on that information. So speaking of information, someone just asked, and this is a really important question because often we don't have all of the information. People don't have the facts. And it, I've been, I was really excited when you talked about the solar farm impact. One of my dear friends, also a Linnean member who may be listening tonight or watching tonight uh, is doing some work with wildlife corridors, um, you know, in terms of like solar production. And so someone asked, how do solar farms negatively impact birds and can it be mitigated? And so it'd be great if you could just provide a very brief overview of how that works for the audience so that we can be better informed. Sure, so uh, I don't, if you've ever dri driven past big solar farms, especially in the desert, you know, they might be hundreds of acres of solar panels in the middle of what is otherwise Sonoran Desert, Sonoran Desert Scrub, California Desert. Um, they impact birds in a number of different ways. Some of them, some of the, I don't think they're making this style anymore, but there are some solar um, farms that have these big collectors in the middle that basically like all of the solar panels reflect at that collector and it makes this big intense, I mean, it's like something from Star Wars <laughs> and like birds, if they get too close to it, they basically disintegrate, they get zapped. Um, birds looking down at those big fields of solar panels mistake them for water and fly into them and crash and die. Um, it's been fascinating, like, like uh, Ridgeway's rail and stuff like that has been found in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, um, nowhere near water, um, thinking that was water ducks, waterfowl, gulls, things like that. Um, just the, the fact of creating them destroys a bunch of habitat. And so there's just sort of the footprint of the, of the development that impacts birds. Um, the roads that are created to access the, the solar farms impacts uh, birds. Now there's vehicles going and so there's collisions with vehicles. Um, it requires a fair amount of water to keep the solar panels clean and dust free so that they can be as efficient as possible in absorbing that solar energy. Um, and as you can imagine, we don't have a ton of water in the Sonoran Desert and so that's another issue. Um, yeah, so can that be mitigated? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't, I, you know, no, not entirely, but I think that there are absolutely things we can do both in terms of being thoughtful about where we're placing things, um, being thoughtful about um, just how we're designing stuff. Uh, the, the wind energy, that's a whole other uh, can of worms to get into. Uh, but I think there are ways that we can at least at a minimum work to minimize negative impacts to birds or reduce negative impacts to birds. Yeah, and it kind of goes back to the balancing human and avian needs, and it's a constant struggle. And so I really appreciate all of the work you've done. And I'm going to ask just one last question. I know I said last question three questions ago, but um, I think everyone here, I, there might be a few people who are in the Southwest or elsewhere in the world, but what do you think anyone could do to help some of the efforts that are going on in your local area and some of the research and studies and conservation outreach and all of advocacy and policy changing and management, all the things that you're involved in. Like, is there anything that we can do as, as a primarily in New York community to help you? Yeah, well, here, I'm gonna take off my Fish and Wildlife Service hat. <laughs> I'm gonna put on my private citizen Jenny hat. Okay, speaking as a private citizen, you know, there, there are a couple of things. There's one thing in general, and then one thing that just happened today that I'll share with you, um, the border wall and everything associated with the border wall, continued construction of the border wall, habitat destruction as a result of the border wall, the militarization of the border, um, all of the roads, the lights along the border. I mean, all of that is just horribly destructive to birds and to wildlife. And so being an advocate to, to stop that. Um, when I first moved to Southeast Arizona in 2001, um, there, there was a big push to build more wall then. And then it kind of slowed down until, you know, the, the 45th presidential administration when there was a lot more wall constructed. Um, and back then I remember people talking about, okay, the wall's going up, we can't, we're not gonna stop it. We need to focus on how are we going to take it down? Um, and I don't know if that's gonna happen, but it sure would be nice. Um, so anything you can do to advocate for, for not spending more money on, on that atrocity. Um, and then here's a really cool thing that happened today. So Raul Grijalva is the, the chair of the House Natural Resources Committee. And he's one of our congressmen here in Tucson. And he started a discussion to talk about 
how um, the federal government can work with tribes across the country to co-manage uh, federally owned lands and to help uh, restore sovereignty to tribes. And so I would say anything that you can do, whether it's in New York, whether it's here, whether it's um, anywhere in our country to help uh, restore sovereignty to tribal nations would be a huge step. Um, tribes are across the world, not just in the United States, you know, have, they hold a lot of biodiversity um, and by restoring that to them, I think we do a lot for um, improving the state of the world all around. I think that's a great message to leave everyone with and gives everyone a little something to think about and some action they can take in their lives. And so with that, I'm gonna thank you so much again, Jenny. I think this was a wonderful talk. Congratulations on being an Eisenman Medal Award winner. And uh, we hope that you will tune into some of our talks in the future. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Ken. Thank you so much, Rochelle. And thank you, Jenny. I could see we made the right choice for that Eisenman Medal this year. You are a, you're a human vitamin pill for birds and conservation. And I, I just wish I could clone you and spread you all over the Southwest, uh, across the entire border, really. Uh, seriously, thank you so much for the important work that you do. Uh, everything from lighting that little spark in a young birder to reaching across geopolitical boundaries as you do. Um, it, it's fascinating and so important. And uh, please keep doing everything that you're doing. And thank you kindly again for a very, very wonderful program tonight. Um, to everyone, I say thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, this now concludes tonight's uh, annual meeting of the Linnaean Society of New York. And I will, um, I will just say, please don't forget to vote and uh, do it tonight if you could, um, and stay active, stay positive, stay connected to nature. And I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible again where the birds are. Take care and good night, everybody.